Okay, do you want to add the oil? Yeah. Freshly squeezed, too, by the way. I want you to know. Yeah, that's enough. You don't want to drown them. Say oily to bed. <laughs> Let me try. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. I'm going to turn on the burner. Okay, you don't need a match for that. No, no. This is actually a stove that's been built in the last 80 years. Don't need a match. <laughs> All right. Are you going to wait for the oil to heat up first? I'm not going to strike until the oil is really hot. And you're not going to strike a match either, apparently. No. No. How do you test the oil? Do you just put your finger in there? No, I declined to do that. I did that once. That's the, the reason that that finger over there is missing, actually. Just the tip. <laughs> okay. Maybe you should toss them in, or at least toss one in. All right. There you go. Wait a minute. Exciting. Yeah. You know, everything around us. Should I put the lid on? I'll put the lid on. The earth, the moon, trees, lapdogs, this cuisine art over here. You and I, we're all made from chemicals cooked up a long, long time ago in stars. Well, we're not in stars in the moment. We're in Seth's kitchen and we're going to demonstrate how this process works. Now, let's say, if you haven't guessed what we're making, that these popcorn kernels here... <laughs> are those early stars. This pan then becomes the hot early universe, a moment in cosmic history after the Big Bang did its thing. Exactly. And the oil that's in there, the oil that's sizzling away, what yeah. does that represent? Well, I, I don't know really what it represents, but we, we could say that it's the stuff that filled the early universe, you know, these, these particles and so forth. Okay, did you hear that? Let's put the rest in. Okay, hang on. Oh, okay, watch it. Jeez, yeah. You better wear goggles. That's a lot of stars. We've got a couple hundred billion here. <laughs> it's a big bottle. Okay, so those stars are cooking away. Now, in the real early universe, what actually made the stars cook? It wasn't hot oil. No, it was their own gravity. I mean, they were slowly contracting under their own weight, which, of course, sounds kind of painful, but for a star, it's perfectly natural. And it allowed them to, you know, convert hydrogen into helium, cook up the helium into heavier elements, heavier elements that otherwise didn't exist shortly after the Big Bang. Ooh, that's the sound. Heavy elements such as carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus, even oxygen. And then suddenly... Oh. <laughs> okay, the stars exploded and they blew all, <laughs> they blew all those new, new elements out into space. Oh, that's hot. Or rather, they did 13 billion years ago, seeding the universe with the building blocks of most everything. Nearly everything is stardust. Even this popcorn is stardust, and it actually tastes pretty good. I'm just going to put these stars into a bowl. Maybe I'll combine them with a little bit of salt and butter. Watch your fingers. Ah. I'm Seth Shostak. I'm Molly Bentley. Welcome to Big Picture Science, produced at the SETI Institute, where researchers investigate the nature and origin of life. Maybe a little bit more salt on those? Okay, I got, I got some, you know, special buttery salt, too. Okay. On Big Picture Science, we step back to get the wide-angle view on science and technology. And in this episode, the long-term view of us. We came from stars a long, long time ago, and then we evolved into a species that could not only understand our origins, but plot our own future. And some say that that future is to go back to the stars. It's, and to space we return. Mmm, mm, it's, it's not too bad, really. No, it's actually pretty good. Some of those primordial stars, that is, siblings of the stellar ancestors that made the ingredients of your body, are still around and visible. Well, the oldest stars that we see still shining are on the order of 13 and a half billion years old, almost, but not quite as old as the Big Bang itself. Astronomer Timothy Beers says that these now ancient stars helped cook up the elements of the universe in their youth. But it was a struggle. After the Big Bang, there were only a paltry number of light elements in place, hydrogen, helium, and a minuscule amount of lithium. These elements formed the first stars, but then it was the job of these stars to become heavy element cooks and churn out more than seven dozen other entries of the periodic table. Professor Beers has worked with a team at the University of Notre Dame to make large-scale surveys of the Milky Way, sifting through literally millions of stars to identify those few that have recorded the chemistry of the very early universe and the nature of the stars from whence we all came. Well, the very first stars, it appears now, 
we're very prodigious producers of light elements such as carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, magnesium, aluminum, silicon, elements which remarkably are the stuff out of which rocky planets such as the Earth can begin to form. So one of the remarkable uh, discoveries of the last few years is that these massive first stars had the ability during their short lifetimes to produce elements which are necessary for life. And so that process began very early and over time more and more stars most of them massive, not as massive, but most of them massive themselves. When you say massive, uh, compare that to the sun. Say 10 to 20 times the sun's mass. Okay. Those stars, over time, continued to produce heavy elements through different pathways of nucleosynthesis that we study. And what I find remarkable, what keeps my day interesting, is I can speculate and then test ideas about how individual elements that I can measure in ancient stars came to be so that we can plausibly account, for example, for the gold in your ring. I can tell you about the nucleosynthesis processes and the kinds of stars that likely produced that material. Ultimately, we're talking about human beings. Where did we come from? Well, we are the assembly of all of this chemical evolution. And it's fascinating to me that we can now run the clock backwards using these ancient stars as tracers. And we can find them here today. We can find them in the Milky Way. We don't have to go to the edge of the universe. We can find them. They're rare, but we can find them. Okay, so these are the factories, if you will, that eventually made the, well, what is it, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, mm -hmm. phosphorus, a few other things mm -hmm. that make up 99% of uh, what I am, mm -hmm. except for the personality part. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> But that stuff was all made a long time ago yes. in these very big stars, these first-generation yes. stars. Now, okay, but, you know, they're being cooked in the nuclear fires of that star, that's right down in the center of the star. How, how did it get to, I mean, how did it get out of there? Yes, precisely. When we look as uh, astronomers at a star and we try to study its composition, we don't see to the center. We see the skin on the outside, much like you can see pictures of the surface of the sun. That's what is visible to us. And so we are not privy to looking into the innards of a given star. So in the stars that make heavy elements, they have to go through their lifetime and during the act of either exploding at the end of their lifetime, if they're sufficiently massive, 10 or more times the sun's mass, or just from winds that they blow off material which has reached inside the actual star, it will pollute the medium from which the next generation forms. And that's a slow but steady process that builds up over time, giving us the distribution of heavy elements that we see around us today. Okay, so what you're saying is they cook up this stuff in their inner cores, in their deep <laughs> inner cores, Indeed. and and then they die and blow up and blow it out into space where it's going to be used for somebody else's star coming up. That's precisely it. It's rather like when I tell people, how do you uh, know this to be true? Uh, one analogy that I find useful is it's like a river. You can't easily unpollute a river. Once you start adding pollution in, you'd have to work very hard to start pulling it out. So if you can look for a very pristine star or a very clean river, you know that that river or star must have been formed at a time when nothing was there to pollute it because once the, the process starts, you can't stop it. Okay, so, so space has been polluted by the waste products of stars which turn out to be... That's one way to put it. Yes, yes which turn out to be useful <laughs> for our lifestyle. Necessary. Na na <laughs> namely for life. Okay, so... What about the heavier elements, not the ones that, you know, I don't have too much gold in my body, I don't think, uh, you know, the really heavy things. Are, are they made the same way? Any element beyond iron, iron, if you look at uh, your uh, periodic table that we all carry in our wallets, you'll <laughs> see is uh, element 26. If you ask uh, how elements up to that point formed, that's a fairly straightforward process, capturing of uh, what we call alpha particles, really just helium and fusion reactions and, and fission. Sort of like an H-bomb. Sort of like that. But once you get past iron, the process uh, will no longer be simple. And in fact, what has to happen is we build up heavier elements from what we describe as neutron capture, captures of other fundamental particles that don't themselves carry a charge. Neutrons, as the name suggests, are electrically neutral. So they don't have a charge barrier which which they have to overcome in order to combine with uh, heavy elements such They're as neither iron. Neither attracted nor repelled. Indeed. And so so by capturing neutrons, 
we can build heavier and heavier elements all the way up to the heaviest elements in the periodic table. So what you're telling me, Tim, mm -hmm. is that the gold uh, I don't have lying around, but yes. wish I did. <laughs> Indeed. Stuff. And this heavy, heavy stuff, I don't know if I have any yttrium at home or whatever, <laughs> that this stuff was made in these kind of cosmic catastrophes. It did, these are the results of incredibly dramatic events that took place a long time ago, far away, mm -hmm. and, and they've made their way into my living room. Yes. Well, well, it is true to think of the bulk of the process happening uh, a long time ago. There is some continuation, but massive stars today are relatively rare compared to low-mass stars like the Sun. One thing I should underscore, because it tells all of us a little bit about the detective story aspect of what we do, is we haven't known this uh, origin in the stars storyline for uh, very long, only about 60-some years, because it has been difficult to organize large enough and successful searches for these ancient, you can think of them as the scribes, the stars that have recorded the process. We find those in much greater number today because we figured out how to do it efficiently. They are literally one in a million. We look around at the stars in the Milky Way. We don't have to go elsewhere. We can look in the Milky Way. The problem is there are too many stars in the Milky Way, hundreds of billions of stars. Where do you point your telescope? You have to find them first. And so what I and some of my colleagues have done over the last 30 years is to develop large-scale surveys that actually produce the candidates that the world's biggest telescopes can then point at and understand the origin of those elements. So you're looking for the geriatric population uh, of the Milky Way. Absolutely. And it's not just speculation in the sense that people say, well, how do you know those are the most ancient ones? Well, right. they're unpolluted, so that's a good... Uh, in in uh, other words, when you look at them, they're made of only a few things. Uh, that's right? right. A few heavy elements uh, uh, beyond hydrogen and helium. The most pure star that we found to date has 30 million times less heavy elements than our sun. So for every 30 million atoms of iron in our sun, this star has one. And that's incredibly pure. And in fact, what's remarkable is that this particular star also shows that characteristic carbon, nitrogen, oxygen signature we associate with the first star production. You know, that's, uh, there, there are going to be people who think, you know, that's not a coincidence. It's like the universe thought we were going to be showing up at some point. Well, it does stretch your consciousness because the story I was taught when I was in graduate school and beyond was that it took billions and billions of years, uh, to paraphrase uh, Carl Sagan, it took that long to build up the elements that we are constructed of. But in fact, our recent evidence suggests that the universe was so efficient that there was no chemical limitation to building life after the first several hundred million years. So, in other words, there could be planets with life out there that are 13 billion years old. I mean, three times as old as the Earth. Absolutely. The only thing that differentiates that possibility from improbability is whether or not you could form the rocky planets on which life, as we know it, would have formed. But the physical chemical elements out of which rocky planets could form were present. That's, that's kind of encouraging, isn't it? It is. Yeah. I mean, we're, we're probably not the first kids on the block. One of the arguments that has to be made is how early could this process get going? Because it takes time for life, let alone intelligent life, to evolve. Our results suggest that uh, this was at the very earliest possible moment. Plenty of time. Well, finally, Tim, it sounds like the bottom line is this. Nature in the form of stars has produced the raw ingredients of life. And then those stars, some of them at least, go on to provide the energy for plants and animals to do their thing. So it sounds like we really owe a lot to those twinkling lights that pepper the cosmos, even the ones that are not our own sun, because they seem to be a lot more than merely decorative on a clear night. Yes, I'd, I'd underscore that. In fact, I, I would say one other thing for those people uh, who might want to actually see one of the stars that has recorded early element abundances, one of the brightest stars that uh, has these signatures I've spoken of, the high carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, is only ninth magnitude. Ninth magnitude is bright by astronomical standards. You can't see it with your naked eye, but if you have a binoculars and you want to track it down, you can find this star. It's uh, the star BD plus 44, 493. You can Google that and you will find articles about the star, but importantly, the coordinates because the surveyors have told you where to point your binoculars. You can go and see and witness with your own eye a star that has recorded the first elements produced in the universe.
probably the oldest thing you can look at with your eyes. I would say yes. Tim Beers, thanks so very much for being with us today. Always a pleasure. Timothy Beers is an astronomer at the University of Notre Dame. And again, that star that he mentioned, one of the earliest ones in the universe that we can still see, is named like this. BD, then a plus sign, then 44, a space, and 493. Might make a nice password. But Seth, how did how did this star get a name like that? Well, actually, that goes back uh, about 160 years to something called the Bonner Dirch Musterung Catalog. It was a catalog of, I don't know, thousands and thousands of stars that was compiled in Germany back in the 1850s. And that's why it's called BD and then a whole bunch of numbers. Well, what do the numbers mean? Well, the numbers are just the number in the catalog, and they do have a rough correlation with their position on the sky. So it it helps a little bit. If you know the number of the star, you have some idea where you might find it in the sky. Well, why can't they name the stars the one? Well, Bob, yeah. Or the one that's a little bit right to that super bright star that's right above me. Well, that takes a lot of text to uh, write down. Now, when we talk about all the elements in the periodic table and the, the idea that these early stars made the heavy elements, but those stars didn't make all the elements of the periodic table because some of them are man-made. Well, you're right. The first 92 elements are called the naturally occurring elements. I mean, all elements occur naturally in some greater sense. But it is true that if you try and make element 93, 94, 95, these heavier elements, uh, they're unstable. They break apart right away. So if nature makes them, and it probably does in some you know, dramatic fashion during a supernova and so forth, they, they disappear right away. So if you want to make them and see them, you have to make them artificially in a linear accelerator, some other machine. Is the element that I like to call molybdenum, is that a stable element? Yes, molybdenum. And it is a naturally occurring element, and it is stable. At least the element is stable. Well, in the last four billion years, Earth has become host to squirming, squishy biology, which is now able to understand where it came from and chart its own future. And some say that that future must include going back to the stars. Our plan for space travel next. It's And to Space We Return on Big Picture Science. Here we are on Earth, still. Our spacefaring species has gotten no farther than the moon, and let me tell you, I take this personally. As far as the promise of space travel goes, I got a raw deal. See, I grew up in the 1950s when we were told that we would start our journeys into space by going to the nearest celestial body. We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other thing, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Well, we were true to our word as far as that goes. The Apollo missions made lunar touchdowns a half dozen times, and it was an exciting era, not only for the extraordinary feat of having feet on the moon, but for the promise of more space travel to come. We would keep going, we were told, first to Mars and who knows where. The human species would venture to the other planets in the solar system and maybe even beyond. Well, it was the promise of life in space stoked by popular culture, such as the series Tom Corbett, Space Cadet. Tom Corbett, Space Cadet. Commander, our course will take us to Mars, we'll circle the planet once, and then we'll return to Earth. Bye. That was the vision back then. We were all going to carry business cards that read Space Cadet. Well, I don't have such a business card in my wallet today, and I can't help feel that someone owes me big time. Hey, Chris Impey, you're an astronomer, and you think that we're destined to explore and colonize the solar system, but I'm sorry, I just don't see it. My feet are firmly and sadly stuck here on terra firma, and they seem destined to stay here. So what went wrong? I don't know if it went wrong, but it was sort of a false start. The first space age was driven by a geopolitical pissing contest between the 
world's two extant superpowers. And that sort of played itself out by the 1970s. And so we sort of fell into a place of needing a new motivation to go into space. And I think we're finding that now. Okay, what is it? I mean, back then, yes, all right, this was a matter of uh, geopolitical uh, posturing, maneuvering, showing who was the better nation <laughs> in some sense. What's the motivation now? Or do we have to wait for some potential enemy to demonstrate some capability again? Well, the military thing will always lurk in the background, and that's something we're just going to have to be aware of. But the new motivations are going to be a variegated set. Exploration will still be there, just the, the joy of going to a new place and the adventure of it. Science will still be there. But there will be commercial motivations, tourism, getting an economic enterprise going off Earth and being the first people to do that. You know, about a decade ago, I attended a space development conference, whatever that meant, in the Midwest. And there was a guy there who was really in the hotel biz. And what he was saying, he'd already, you know, done some market research, in fact, that the big market was for people who wanted to spend a weekend with their, I don't know, their wife or husband in orbit just for the great views that their hotel room would have. And he anticipated that this was going to be the economic driver for uh, our expansion into space. Any comment on that? Sure. That was probably Robert Bigelow, and he is one of the space entrepreneurs. And he, I think he founded the Motel 8 chain. He's a billionaire. He's kind of quirky. His scientific views are all over the place. But he truly thinks that we have a, a business venture. And he's had hundreds of millions of dollars in NASA contracts to deploy sort of inflatable proto-hotels off of the space station. So he's actually already in the game. And yes, indeed, we'll be going up there for weekends with our own wives or other people's wives. Or, you know, they're going to be sex motels, let's be honest. As we know, every new technology has had pornography or sex at its bleeding or leading edge. And I guess we should not be squeamish about admitting that space is no exception. Yes. Well, I have to say that this gentleman who was proposing this, and it was not actually Robert Bigelow, but he said that the results of his market survey show that the prime motivation for people wanting to do this was indeed weightless sex. So maybe you're right about that. What about colonization of the moon or Mars? <laughs> Talk to folks anywhere. Most of them will say, hey, we're going to do that. But these are pretty tough locales, despite the sci-fi stories. Are we really going to have colonies on these worlds? I think in a couple of decades, yes. The, the interesting thing is that it, the cost of getting there is substantial, but the technologies to live there, to create a habitat, are, are really quite simple. Um, they've had little uh, machines running in a couple of NASA centers that just routinely take Martian or lunar type soil and they can generate enough water, oxygen, and turn it into slump block to build a habitat. That's pretty easy to do. So we can build a base. Uh, why would we? Why should we? I think it would be to learn how to live off Earth. These are baby steps of something that is really projecting a much longer view of where we're going to be in 50 or 100 years. Well, that would perhaps give us some sort of insurance against total destruction of uh, ourselves here on the planet. Uh, if we're spread out, if we've you know, gone to these other worlds and established colonies, even small colonies, then isn't that some sort of protection for Homo sapiens? It's covering our bets, but it's only a privileged few, you know, far less than the 1% who are going to cover their bets. I think the people who are in this for the long haul will imagine an economic enterprise that could be really substantial. For instance, space elevators, you know, they sit eternally in the future. Arthur C. Clarke's famous quote, you know, people will have space elevators 50 years after everyone stops laughing. The space elevator, of course, is a way to get up into space without using a rocket, and it can reduce the cost by, you know, if maybe a factor of 100, so it makes it uh, quite affordable to put stuff up into orbit. We could build a space elevator on the moon. So if you have a moon base, you have a staging post for uh, going out there and mining asteroids or traveling around the solar system fairly cheaply. So even though going back to the moon seems kind of mundane and old hat, we've been there, we've done that, it's actually the first best staging post for exploration around the solar system and living maybe on Mars. So. That kind of investment could happen within a couple of decades. I think a terrestrial space elevator, that's not going to happen for quite a long time. Now, we talked about these colonies on the moon and Mars. I'm not sure that people are aware as to how hostile an environment Mars really is. I mean, you look at the pictures and it looks like, well, I mean, it looks like Arizona without the cacti. <laughs> but in fact, it's, it's pretty awful. Is that the place where we really want to have colonies or would we do better to have rotating aluminum cans and orbit around the Earth, as were described in the 1970s. 
Yes, I agree. Mars is, is a pretty nasty place to be. I suppose the only reason to be there in the long haul is if you can terraform it and turn it into a more habitable environment. And that by long haul, we're talking centuries or millennium time scale. So, yeah, Mars is tough. It's very hazardous to get there. And it's, of course, interesting that with Mars One, whether you believe they'll get there or not, they had 100,000 people willing to sign up in a very short time to make a one-way trip there and die there. So there's certainly people willing to accept the risks, which will, in that case, include, you know, that's a one-way ticket. Yeah, but, I mean, they, they're not sending them with the idea that you've got about a week to take pictures and then you'll die, right? I mean, the idea is to colonize the place. Right. And I think, but even the people who sign on may be a little naive, recognize that the idea of a viable colony is, has a lot of extrapolation from what we can do right now. One of the arguments made against sending people into space is that you can get a lot more science done if you send, you know, robot explorers. They don't insist on a round-trip ticket. I guess some people don't either, but, you know, they're programmed to do what you want them to do. There's no danger. You don't need life support systems, et cetera, et cetera. And yet we continue to talk about putting people into space. Why is that? Yes, it's worth examining because you're right. Amongst astronomers and space scientists, it's a slam dunk. Robots, especially with miniaturization, you get so much bang for the buck sending a miniaturized space probe or even a big space probe out there. It doesn't have to be fed and maintained and diverted with entertainment. But if we're going to get the culture as a whole to sign on to the space activity, to be invested in it, to take it seriously and be interested in it, I think we have to be there. And we saw this a little bit with the servicing missions of the Hubble Space Telescope, which the astronauts fought bitterly to be on those shuttle missions because it was the greatest test of an astronaut to do a Hubble servicing mission. And even the public recognized that these people were doing quite extraordinary things in space. Sure, there's a lot of plumbing and electrical work uh, that you'd have done around your house maybe, but they were taking risks and they were doing things that really robots actually can't do. So I think as long as people recognize there are things that robots can't do in space and that the projection of us out into space is an adventure as bold as when we left Africa 60,000 years ago, I think they might be interested in it. Going into space has a very strong element of exploration, of course, and you argue that exploration might actually have a genetic component. There's some interesting research on what's called the DRD4 gene, or one allele of it, that has correlated in one fascinating study with uh, different cultures around the world over tens of thousands of years. The more they migrate, the more prevalent this allele of that gene is. It's also correlated with some more interesting things like ADHD and autism. So the concept is that there's a genetic component to curiosity, to thrill-seeking, to risk-taking. And indeed, humans are the only species on the planet that have traveled in hunter-gatherer times over large fractions of the Earth without the immediate need for survival or finding a food source. So it seems like historically we are driven to explore far beyond what we need to do. Well, there have been societies that didn't value exploration, but as far as I can tell, most of those are past tense. That's right. So the explorer sort of gets the spoils. Uh, it's not always been good for those who are explored in the history of humankind. I suppose the good thing about going into space is we don't think it's very heavily habited. So. Will be it'll be virgin real estate, <laughs> or maybe virgin galactic real estate. <laughs> yes. Well, Chris, what about the rest of the universe beyond the solar system? We've talked about, you know, worlds as far away as Mars. I suppose we could go farther than that. They get less attractive. Not that Mars is that attractive, but once you get beyond Mars, it's even worse. But will we ever, ever, go to the stars? Yeah, it's that one's tantalizing. I mean, ever is, of course, a long time. So, yes, we will ever go there. We're not going to teleport there, even if it's not ruled out by the laws of physics. Just don't really see any way for that. However, the technologies, the medical technologies to take us into some form of suspended animation have progressed quite a lot in the last few decades. So we can imagine that we could be taken into a down or a wait state and into a battle-hardened, cosmic ray-hardened sarcophagus sent through the voids of space to a distant star system to be reawakened to inhabit an Earth-like world that had been scoped out before our arrival. So yes, I could see that happening in a few centuries. So if it's possible, you know, just 
a couple of centuries after, you know, after the Renaissance for us, within a thousand years of the Renaissance, we might be able to do that? I think it's possible. And, you know, if 100,000 people are willing to go on a one-way trip to Mars now, in a few centuries, I think some crazy set of a few dozen people are willing to go in that sarcophagus and taken into a wait state for an uncertain future to a place where they know they can never return from. But if that's the case, why don't we see evidence of some sort of colonization of the galaxy? It's, of course, the great question and asked by Fermi 60 years ago. We assume it's hard for us, so it's hard for them, and maybe not too many cultures make that transition. Well, finally, Chris, what about yourself? Would you go into space given the opportunity? I think I would. It, uh, there was a telling moment when I was a postdoc at Caltech. Um, the Challenger had blown up the day before, and we were in the, the postdocs and grad students were all in the coffee room, very somber. And then someone just stopped the conversation and said, okay, NASA administrator calls, offers you a spot on the next shuttle for free, you know, would you go? Everyone in the room said they would. So, I mean, that's an astronomy-type crowd. Um, but in my cohort, you know, the willingness to do it and the enthusiasm for it is, is very deep-seated, and for me, too. Chris MP, thanks so much for being with us today. It was a pleasure, Seth. Chris Impey is an astronomer at the University of Arizona. He's the author of Beyond, Our Future in Space. And he claims that we do have a future in space. I wonder which generation will be the one to go and live on Mars. Can you hazard a guess? Well, of course I can hazard a guess. I always figured it was my generation, but apparently that's not going to be the case. The facts are that if we really had the incentive to go to Mars in the next five years, we could put people on Mars in the next five years. That's not going to happen. There are projects such as Mars One that are, you know, enlisting people to go to Mars. Whether they can actually do it or not is still quite unclear. So I'm not, I'm not sure about this generation. I think the next generation, yeah, there's so much interest in this, and the technology is getting a little bit better. So, you know, we missed by one. 10,000 generations of humans, you missed by one. But isn't there the question of where we put our efforts, and shouldn't we put our efforts to protecting our planet here and making it more livable? Why go to another planet and start all over again? Well, you can always make that argument. You could have made that argument to the pilgrims and said, look, just stay here in Holland, which is where they were, and just try and improve things here rather than getting on these ships and going across the Atlantic. But, you know, there's always the opportunity for those that are willing to dare to get, you know, a, a new environment going, and that might pay off in the long term. In the short term, it might not, but in the long term, it may. Chris M. Peep talks about, you know, this genetic predisposition to exploration, and the fact that there's some genetic component to this suggests that, you know, being an explorer, taking that chance, daring to go across the mountains or, you know, across space, has some long-term survival benefit. The only thing that disturbs me is that if there is an incentive to go and explore not just for us, but for other species, there's the question of why the galaxy doesn't seem to be colonized. Chris Impey says that we may one day go to the stars. That's a very long trip. Will we be the same species when we arrive as when we left? That's next. It's And to Space We Return from Big Picture Science. Okay, Chris Impey has revived my hopes that we'll go to the stars, or at least to some nearby planets. But who will we be when we arrive? My name is Cameron Smith. I'm an archaeologist at Portland State University. I've studied the human past, um, but I'm also interested in the distant human future. And in the long term, as we colonize space, we're going to change. Our bodies are going to change. Our values are going to change. Our language will change. Everything about humanity will change. Some of it will be subtle, and some will be dramatic. Dr. Smith also works with Icarus Interstellar, an organization that investigates the possibility of interstellar flight. He studies the biological and cultural implications of such a voyage and says that while humans might eventually build spacecraft that will send colonists to other star systems, it's not clear that the beings who disembark from the spacecraft will be the same humans that left. Here's some perspective. 
You know how when you set out on a really long car drive, you begin fresh, you're hopeful, full of adventure, but 16 hours later, when you arrive at your destination, well, you're not the same. You're cranky, you're bloated, you've mentally composed a stern letter to the Federal Highway Administration about the dismaying sanitary conditions of rest stops. But otherwise, you are still you. I'm hot, I'm sweaty, I don't even know what this rash is. Plus, I'm delightfully bloated thanks to four bacon cheeseburgers, two blueberry slushies, and a bag of gummy worms. And if I ever see another granny in the fast lane, I'm going to take her out. But at least I remain homo sapiens. But if your destination were another star system, such as Alpha Centauri, that might not be how it goes. For the very long, ultra-long space missions beyond our solar system, which could easily require tens of thousands of years, Dr. Smith notes an interesting and seldom-discussed problem with voyaging on the starship Enterprise. Namely, that the human crew might not remain the same kind of human. Evolution could change us, if not into a different species, at least to something different from the one that left. That is, if we lived that long. The time needed to uh, reach an exoplanet and a distant solar system, we're looking at multiple uh, centuries to get to a relatively close by a star system. So if we're talking about multiple centuries, then yes. this is also a multi-generational trip. You bet. In other words, you would be having your children on board this ship, and they would grow up and have their children, and so on and so on. So it might be many descendants along the way that actually reach this star system. That's right, and you can divide things. In archaeology, in human evolution, we, we tend to divide things into threes. The early Neolithic, the middle Neolithic, the late Neolithic, for example. If we do that with a multi-generational voyage to a different star... I can imagine, for example, an early age where you still have connections with Earth and you're not thinking too much about the distant planet. And then a middle age where people are born who have never been to Earth and will never be on Earth. They will also never reach the exoplanet. So they are in this extraordinary condition of hurtling between right, these points. And then a third age where you have nothing to do with Earth. Earth is a memory. However, you are coming up on the destination. And now, imagine the cultural changes and the new priorities and so on as people think about planetness again. Let's have you describe the ship, or at least what the closed system would be like. And the idea is that everything that one would need would have to be on board. So food and water, medicine and clothing. And if you didn't bring it along, you'd have to bring along the seeds or the elements so that you could develop or grow these items on the ship. Right. Uh, you know, when you envision a world ship, you think of maybe people living in barracks and bunk beds and, you know, kind of like a crew of a submarine. Actually, we should think about something like a small village. Uh, any town USA, for example, a lot of people will be doing farming. I mean, farming is going to be the backbone. That's where we're going to get our food. And there will be technicians. There will be uh, people working on the ship, maintaining it. There will be people who go to university and educate the next generation. The big challenge is that it is a closed ecology and that everything that's required for multiple generations has to be functional and transportable across a vast distance before you reach resources again, which is another planet. Imagine one of the most important consumables, uh, oxygen. On a multi-generational voyage where you don't have the possibility to pick up any more oxygen <laughs> between here and that exoplanet, you're going to have to account for every molecule of oxygen. You can't have it leak away over multiple centuries. So the engineering challenges are tremendous. Well, so Cameron, what happens to humans over time? What sort of pressures would force them to change, perhaps even evolve, and, and why? Humanity will change significantly. Our culture will change. Uh, let's think about language, the words we use. Languages change, of course. Uh, it takes uh, sometimes centuries. But imagine the difference between uh, Middle English, let's say of Shakespeare's time, and our English. Now, that's only four or five centuries. So five centuries, and now you need a special uh, you know, training to understand uh, Shakespearean English. And that's because changes in, for example, vocabulary. Symbolism and metaphor are critically important to how we communicate. So if I say it's as big as a whale, right? Okay, now you have an idea of something very big. What about if you're in the middle generation? You're not 
going to reach the exoplanet and you have never experienced Earth and you have nothing in your mind about oceans or big <laughs> sea mammals called whales, how often will the whale metaphor be used? By the time we get to the exoplanet, whale is a mythical thing. Now, it might seem trivial. Well, of course, you know, small things like that will change. But cumulatively, a lot of things like that will change. A lot of symbols are going to be cast away or forgotten or left behind. And you have a new culture. Well, anyone who's had children knows what sort of changes can arise, <laughs> develop between one generation, between parents and their and their teenagers. So what you're saying you is over, <laughs> over a hundreds of years, there might be this great cultural divergence. But, but what about physically? Could, could there be physical changes to humans? And can we even talk about evolution? Absolutely. So humanity will continue to evolve biologically. Uh, let's look at some basic physical parameters. On Earth, we've lived under uh, air pressure, atmospheric pressure at sea level of about 14.7 pounds per square inch. Call it 15 pounds per square inch, right? Now, for the past 4 million years of hominin evolution, we have lived under those conditions. Some people have migrated up to high altitudes, but most of us down on the surface. For a lot of reasons, these world ships might well be constructed with a slightly different atmospheric pressure let's say 5 PSI, or let's say 10 PSI. Uh, different pressures and different gas compositions affect genetic development. They affect the development of the embryo, for example. So over time, we will have a biological adaptation even to the conditions of the world ship that we construct. And then, of course, when we arrive at a new planet, uh, we will have biological adaptations there. How so? Specifically, what would that next generation of humans be like? Well, if, if you change those conditions too terribly much, uh, oxygenation, for example, you get uh, biological retardation in the tissues. You get uh, tissues growing out of sequence when you change the breathing gas composition and the pressure. So is what you're saying that you know, there would be less pressure, atmospheric pressure in the ship, gravity might be accommodated for, but maybe there would be less gravity, we would have radiation coming at the ship, and maybe some of that would leak through. Absolutely. And that human beings, if they survive, they will have to evolve. So I'm wondering if you could give me, give us a picture of what these humans, if they continue to be humans, what they would look like many generations down the line. Would they be mutants? Uh, physically, what would they look like? Well, you have uh, human biological adaptation to different regions of the earth. Right? So in the last 50,000 years, uh, we have people with darker skin, we have people with lighter skin, different hair textures, uh, short, stocky st uh, stature up in the Arctic, a uh, taller, thinner population or uh, stature, for example, along the Nile. Right? native people in those areas. We can expect the same kind of what's called phenotypic or, or bodily variation when we adapt to new planets or even the conditions inside, a, uh, inside a, a world ship. So we might well arrive there at an exoplanet, you know, slightly different, taller or shorter, different skin or hair colors, that sort of thing. But we, we don't need to invoke, for example, extra limbs or anything like this. Much of our adaptation is cultural and technological. Well, I'm going to press you on that since the premise is that we're going to change. I'm pressing you on the details for how we might change physically. And I'm wondering if you could hazard a guess as to what characteristics might be selected for mm. or against in this new species of human. Can we say new species? Well, species, uh, if they could not have productive offspring, that is, mate with people back on Earth and have, have viable offspring, if they could not do that, then that's biological speciation. And so it might be uh, Homo cosmicus, is what the Russian Tsiolkovsky called it uh, back at the turn of the century. Homo cosmicus rather than Homo, species, uh, okay. homo sapiens. Okay, so it's not a speciation event, but it sounds as though there might be specific characteristics that sure. could be selected for or against, and I wonder if you could tell us what those might be. Well, the the physical characteristics, I don't know how they would show up, uh, you know, visibly, but there would be selection for, for example, people who carry a particular form of, of a gene called ATRX. Uh, there's a certain form of this gene that, that helps with blood oxygenation. And if you have this particular form of a gene, of this gene, uh, you have better blood oxygenation. Well, that would be handy if you're using a slightly different uh, oxygen composition than what we've evolved here on Earth. And so... If there's a physical characteristic, right, that goes along with that ATRX gene, 
you know, a slightly different skin hue or something like that, then we might well see that those characteristics change. Now, Cameron, this is all assuming that we don't go into suspended animation. This was an idea... Chris Impey was not the first to propose it, but Mm. he did suggest it earlier in the show. If we were to go into suspended animation, then that would, you know, we wouldn't change at all. We would just wake up hundreds of years later (laughs) at our new planet. Yes, and I think that would be a rude awakening. I think it would be a heck of a shock, uh, culturally, probably biologically, too. Um, And I've noted in biology, sometimes there are radical changes in a short time span. And sometimes that happens culturally. And sometimes people survive it or organisms survive radical change on the short term. However, most biological change occurs incrementally, slowly. And I think it's better for humanity, both culturally and biologically, don't make conditions for humanity radically different than what we've experienced. Let's make the world ship a place that is livable with an architecture that gives you a life that is somewhat familiar to humanity. So uh, people have also said, well, you just send 100 people and then a big gene bank, right? And then you have uh, all kinds of technological reproductive systems when you get to that exoplanet. I think that's also a bad idea culturally. It's too radical a change. And uh, I think we should we should go in numbers, in situations that are somewhat familiar to humanity, not alien. Cameron Smith, thank you so much for speaking with us. Thank you. Cameron Smith is an archaeologist at Portland State University. Well, it's a sobering thought that these generation ships might result in the people who get off the ship weren't the same as the people who got on. I mean, even aside from the fact that they may evolve in various biological ways, certainly they're going to evolve culturally. They may not even know why they're on that ship by that point. You don't think someone would have left a post-it or memo for the generations to come? This is why you're traveling through interstellar space? Yeah, well, they they might have left the post-it, but, I, you know, they might not be able to read the post-it. Their language might be completely different by then. I have a hard time picturing the ship and the size of it. Uh, this would be an enormous ship, and as he said, there would be farming on board. And with the descriptions he gave, it sounds as though you would design the ship so that it resembled Earth as closely as possible, that it would actually seem normal to be on the ship traveling for centuries through space. Well, that idea certainly has been explored in terms of building habitats closer to Earth. We have, you know, rotating aluminum cans in space, as we've occasionally talked about, and you would have the farming can over here, and this is the living can here. But at least in that case, if you really get stir-crazy, you can always take a trip back to Earth and, you know, replenish yourself, as it were. And if you wanted to get something to eat, would you go to the canteen, the rotating canteen? The rotating canteen. It's kind of neat if you're in one of those rotating aluminum cans because you can look up and see your neighbors uh, up above you. Of course, these cans are bigger than tin cans, right? Because I don't know how many humans you can fit into a tin can, but I bet it's not more than two. Well, uh, your average tin can. But these, these tin cans are like 10 miles long and one mile across, and it turns out you can put millions of people in one of those things, and they all have their own garage. So this episode of Big Picture Science really is big picture because we started with the, you know, the concoction of the materials that make up our bodies 13, 12 billion years ago and gone all the way to the future where our descendants might go back into space. You know, those chemicals that were cooked up 12 billion years ago are going to go back into space as our descendants. So I guess the bottom line is, well, there's no bottom line. Our destiny, our future, they seem to truly be unbounded. Thanks to the stars that helped produce this show, Gary Niederhoff and Barbara Vance. Also thanks to financial support from Rena Sholsky david and Sammy David and the NASA Astrobiology Institute. Big Picture Science is produced at the SETI Institute, where scientists study the origin and nature of life. And a big thanks also to our listeners. Your ears have been attuned to And to Space We Return. If you'd like to hear more Big Picture Science, you'll find it on our archive 
on our website, bigpicturescience.org. If you're a podcast listener, but you prefer listening to over-the-air radio because it's already going into space, well, check out the listing on our website of radio stations that carry the program. And if your local station is not on that list, consider letting them know you like the show. Oh, and have a comment, a criticism, a suggestion, throw in some faint praise, and then email it all to bigpicturescience at SETI.org. Hey, Granny, get that out of the fast lane. Don't tell me what to do, you stupid hipster, or I'll break your face. Sorry, ma'am. 